exactly right, because indeed uh, a lot of our colleagues uh, work, uh, still work manually. They, uh, they produce maybe good results, but uh, indeed they do not use uh, contemporary technologies. And in general, I would like to say that the progress in social sciences is uh, much less visible to society than progress in biology, physics, and uh, hard sciences. It's a general <laughs> Yeah, but it's, uh, it's more difficult for objective reasons. But still, uh, I do not fully agree uh, with you because I would like to quote only two um, cases. Uh, I participated in a big European project on a new field, uh, interdisciplinary field, with a leading new role of geographer, about mental maps, uh, rep uh, representations, and its uh, their, imp their importance in the processes of bordering and rebordering. It's new field, mm -hmm. it's relatively inno innovative, not completely new, but innovative. And uh, uh, we used uh, about 10,000 so, uh, so uh, 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 questionnaires filled by uh, almost 10,000 respondents, 10,000 students in uh, 18 countries, and they um, received um, maps, and they were asked to draw the boundaries of world regions of Europe, and then uh, all these results, almost 10,000 results, were summarized by special software in which um, and the results uh, are, were very spectacular. It's, it's quite interesting, to my opinion, at least. The second case concerns a recent study of the Moscow Metropolitan uh, Region, also an interdisciplinary study, uh, in cooperation with one of three major mobile phone providers. They registered all moves on, of all uh, their clients uh, in the metropolitan area of Moscow, million, million of uh, movements, and uh, it reversed the representation about the structure of Moscow space. Uh, it was always supposed that all people uh, went every day to the center of downtown in the city, and which provoked traffic jams and many, many other problems, but it, it turned to be that it is not true. Sentry, <coughs> uh, um, fugal, and uh, uh, diagonal moves are, are quite, quite frequent and uh, it was quite important to register and to map all these uh, uh, patterns. So it's of course a pioneering work, maybe still an exceptional work, but uh, it shows us uh, the way and it uh, inspires some optimism as to the, as concerns the perspectives of our discipline. Thank you. Thank you. Before uh, Professor Caruso is going to the airport, is there any question to him? Any remark, anything? Okay. I'm going to take uh, Vladimir now, but I'm just because this is the fifth time he's visited this university, and, and 20 years ago, if it wasn't for him, I would not have known what to buy in a supermarket in Beersheba because he translated for me from the Russian to the English. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much, and have a safe flight. Thank you. And send regards to Mike Meadows. Thanks. Okay, uh, I opened the floor, but uh, I have first one who volunteered to speak first. So, no, please. Yeah. Um, I welcome this uh, presidential conference of uh, six past presidents or present presidents of uh, various geog geography organizations. I would like to start with a question to my colleague in my own department, Shaul, with whom I fight and quarrel a lot about conceptual uh, matters. And uh, Shaul, my friend, I would like to ask you, what kind of precision are you indeed looking for in geography? Or, by extension, in science in general. Are you looking for precision in data gathering? Or are you looking for precision in explanation? And then precision in understanding? This is the major question we all should be concerned about. Because there is a big difference in methodologies of science when one side of the problem is uh, presented 
such as to be precise in gathering data. And, there, and it is a whole kind of a different story when we are looking at it the other way, seeking to improve our explanation and then understand it. Now, I would like to, uh, my second question, and this will be, uh, I will be done with this. Uh, most of the uh, 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 presentations given here in this session, uh, not all of them, most of them relate to, to a, a subfield of geography. I am more concerned with geography as a whole. Some of the students may know I've been teaching uh, geography thought or the history of geography thought in our department. And my main concern is about the discipline as a whole. And my question I would like to raise and to, uh, to put as a thinking uh, 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 um, object or thinking uh, target is why shouldn't we look or how should we reunite our discipline which is presently divided between two major fields. Human geography, which was the main concern of this session, and physical geography, which was not represented here at all. To me, this is one of the major, if not the major challenge of, uh, of geography as a discipline. 150 years ago, the two fields started to depart from each other. And the question we should ask now is, whether or not we have come full circle now to begin thinking about reuniting these two fields together in order to try to think in unified terms to the benefit of man and earth and not in two separate fields that are drifting away or, way, or are they drifting away from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. <coughs> no, you want to react? Yeah, in one sentence, my uh, I'm considering precision as a good uh, habit for all three uh, points you suggested. All of them are included. As, a, as for uh, human geography and physical geography, I limited my presentation to human geography because I think in physical geography they are a, 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 they didn't. Uh, uh, deviate from a uh, position uh, the way human geography did in the uh, two uh, in the 80s and 90s of the previous century. Any comments from the state? Please. Um, I, I don't look at the world as physical and human geography. I look at it as geography. Um, I think that's one of these barriers. That division we just need to get over. Um, if you take a look at physical geography books written 20 years ago, there's physical geography, the human geography, there are human geography. Take a look at physical geography books today that have sections on human physical relations. I think segregating knowledge is leading us not to get an understanding about what in the world's going on and why. You're dealing with natural disasters, emergency preparedness, security issues economic development, um, understanding anything about anything, it's best to be inclusive rather than be exclusive. Um, I, look at, I look at geography in terms of three, three questions. Where is something? But that's not very difficult to answer. You can put that on a map. Okay? That's an A-level question. B is um, why is it the way it is? That's a little bit more difficult. C is, what does it mean? And I think I focus on the, the B and the C. Um, you know, Vladimir described this project back when students in universities in Europe to identify the boundaries. I don't think that's really going to help advance geography because most students couldn't do it. Most politicians couldn't do it. Most geographers couldn't do it. Um, they know where to get the information, where the coastline is, where the capital cities are, where the airports are. They know them. You Google Earth and get your cell phones. But I think, what, what is the knowledge about this? It's important. How is it helping us understand something? That's a completely different question. It's a question asked the GIS people. You know, GIS is really colorful and nifty and gimmicky and everything else. But how much time is spent by GIS scholars looking at critical geography? 
issues, critical GIS, which is who produced the map, who produced the database, who, who's doing the analysis. Those are tricky, those are difficult. There's not a nice, easy answer for that, which is why we're academics. Is there a D? Hmm? Is there a D question? I suppose there is. I look, but I look, I look for commonalities. I look for commonalities. And I, I said, you know, the literature I read, I don't read a lot of the geography literature only. I read disciplinary, interdisciplinary literature. You know, I'm editing a book on just coming out this month on world religions. And it's not just by geography, but people in two dozen different disciplines. I'm editing a book on languages. Um, I want people to contribute from many different disciplines. Also, art is like, what are these over here? This is, this is, this is graphic, isn't it? What is it? Is that somebody's brain? Is that a planetary exploration beyond the universe? Is it a street pattern? It's where? Buildings. It's buildings. It's where? Buildings. A building? Yeah. They'll shovel by night. Yeah. I thought maybe it was upside down piece of art. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yeah, please. First is the question of uh, Abinam. I certainly believe that if we in order to, uh, to prove our legitimacy and our relevancy that uh, you really uh, raised in the beginning, we have to deal with the social, uh, the human, and the physical aspect, and the way that they are integrated. And we are doing it in many ways. And I think when we look at ethical uh, aspect, we speak about environment, nature, which incorporate both aspects. When we speak about the visual aesthetic, we speak about landscape. Uh, when we speak about the emotional, we speak about sense of place, we speak about uh, um, uh, the spiritual, we speak about uh, uh, sacred spaces and profane spaces and so forth. And in all of them, there is an interaction between physical and uh, human aspect. And we should stress this interaction because here we are unique. Here we don't compete with sociologists or geophysicists and so forth. So I completely agree with you. In order to remain uh, relevant, we have to keep this unity of uh, these two aspects. To Sharon, I think one thing uh, you, I have to say in favor that you control the, or dominate the discussion. We all respond to you. And, uh, and, but I think that to a large extent you emphasize the methodological and the technical aspect. And in my view, technology is not replacing the mind, but extending the mind. You can use very sophisticated technology for very arbitrary, even uh, not so smart questions that you ask or answers that you are looking for. There is no direct correlation. And I think the reason is that we have to look at the challenge that you put for us on the level of paradigms, which incorporate conceptualization, methodology, praxis together. So in one level higher. And in this sense, the question that you raise is really uh, difficult to answer. The uh, uh, biology, the achievement of biology are not because of technology because the idea of genes. This is a new paradigm of thinking about uh, of my, of living a uh, species, species. And with it, of course, the technology helps to develop. And I don't know if the egg on the chicken, what is first, the technology or the idea behind uh, that uh, lead to the development of uh, technology, of course. But the level that is crucial to answer your question is the level of paradigm. And there are questions. I, I spoke about new conception of space. Uh, 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 other people here spoke about all kinds of ideas. But are they fundamentally new paradigm? I'm not sure. And here, yes, there are, there are uh, disciplines that uh, develop new paradigms and are uh, blooming. In geography, I'm not sure if we are uh, there at this point. But it's something that cannot happen by itself. Or, or it, it's difficult to say why a paradigm arises at a certain point or, and make a, a, a massive changes. Uh, if there is a need for a new paradigm or not, I, I am not sure. Michael, you want to react to that? 
das Short Comics One to Stanley, a text Stanley is a ride on his idea. What is geography? To say what is geography's role? The first role is to allow people that learn geography or study geography to have the ability to look around them. Secondly, to understand what they see. Thirdly, to interpret what they understand. And fourthly, they do it a good job to be critical about it what they see. That's the way that I look at it, the way the geography, uh, geography is all. And as a response to Avinoam about physical and human geography, I agree with you that in our case at least, in Western societies, there is sort of distinction. When I get papers, and I now edit a, a volume of world studies, paper from Romania or from India, immediately they, they start with the physical layer, and after that they go into the human. But not necessarily there is a link between both of them. I mean, they, they, they were educated to do that, but not necessarily they use it. Look, what we do actually is taking courses of regional geography, and then we bring about the merging between physical and human geography. I teach myself every year regional geography course. This year, even two of them. One of the Galilee, mm -hmm. the second one about the Pacific Islands. And there I bring <laughs> the, the physical layer and explain the form of development because of that layers. But it's not necessary to bring it in or to force it in in every kind of issue. Okay. One of the comments, I'm editing a book with Martin Dodge and the title is Mapping Across the Academy. We think mapping is something which we, it's important to us, which it is, but also think mapping is very important to many other disciplines as well. Not only planning, genetics, uh, anatomy, uh, meteorology, uh, medical sciences, astronomy, archaeology, all of them use maps. And all of them are increasingly using GIS. Okay? And these are fields that didn't have a spatial perspective as part of their traditions. So I think we're opening up some doors to them and windows to them so they can look at the world maybe some different. Even people study literature and poetry and film. I mean, we're, we're educating them. But they're also educating us, aren't they? They're also educating us. Because we have these lacunae, these gaps in our knowledge about humanities. We think maybe we're closest to sociology comes, but we have a lot in common when we talk between film studies, literature studies, tourism studies, philosophy. We have a lot more in common than we think we do. We're not an isolated planet on the universe. We were no one come to visit us. So this is the third book? You work on three books? No, I need to book somewhere. <laughs> uh, uh, before I give to Shaul the floor, I have uh, two short questions to Stanley. Um, you started with the A question, where things are. Shouldn't we ask also where they should be? And this would be the sure. D question. That's sure. the D, yeah. Well, that would be, that's to me, that part of the C question. So what? Okay. That, that could be part of the planning question, yes. And if you can expand a little bit, you mentioned in your uh, uh, talk about uh, what you call subjective uh, spaces and places. Uh, I call them undocumented spaces, for example, um, or subjective landscapes. Can you expand about their importance to us? Well, the reason I became interested in this subject is I was teaching in Cape Town a couple of years ago. I've never been to South Africa before, but I've always been fascinated with it because it's a socially engineered landscape just like yours is, right? Mm -hmm. So is China, by the way. And before I went to Cape Town, I read about Cape Town. And I read you know, this much material about about Cape Town. I learned a lot about Cape Town my first couple of weeks there, but then someone said, let's, let's go to Kailicia. I've never heard of Kailicia before. Kailicia is a black township, about a million people, right outside Cape Town, right away to the airport. Anybody been there? It's in Cape Town. Now. Pardon? Now it's in Cape Town, in the metropolitan yeah. area. Yeah, it's cool. Okay. <laughs> so I became fascinated with Cape Town because I became fascinated with Kailicia because I didn't know anything about it. So I don't want to see how much, how much is, we know about anything. If you want to know anything about anything, you can ask God. If you don't ask God, you can ask Google, okay? <laughs> so you take a look at what we know about Cape Town from the World Wide Web and Google. It's about this much information. How much do you know about Kalisha, which is about this information? So one is about a million people, okay? I and mean, this is about 300,000 people, or 600,000 people on the front count Cape Town. So I became fast, why, do we, why, is this, why is this the case? And to me, this introduced the concept of the geographies and the cartographies of silence. I asked somebody, said, I want to write about Cape Town. I said, can you find me a map, a 
an aerial photograph of, of Cape Town, of, of Carlicia. So somebody gave me before I left a big map about this big, carried back on a plane. It's a very interesting map of Carlicia, but what does it show? Well, it shows major streets, some streets that have names, but large areas of nothing. Nothing. But people live there. People shop there. People make love there. They go to family festivals. They go to church. Their everyday life is there. So it made me think, why don't we know very much about this? Well, you ask scholars who are white scholars, mostly in, in South African universities, they're, they're scared to death. Okay, They're scared to death to go there. You know, geographers are supposed to take risks, but sometimes they're really risk avoiders rather than risk takers, aren't we? So we don't know very much about the people who might be interested in this, like geographers. And who do they write for? Well, they write geographers for other geographers. They don't write for the people in Kailisha, but everybody in Kailisha can tell you something about shopping, friends, family, networks, all landscapes, all those other things you mentioned. To me, these are, these are the terra incognita that John K. Wright talked about in his article in 1947 in the Annals. These are the places that are fascinating to me. Not the place where I lived in Cape Town, which are ultra-gated communities that have barking dogs, electric fences, and bodyguards, and everything else, which I think is maybe more insecurity than insecurity fences. Right? That's one of my observations being around here yesterday, is I'm not sure what security and insecurity is in Israel. They're kind of a thin borderline, aren't they, Gideon? They really are, in many ways. And you have to kind of wonder, do you have your pet dogs to protect you? I don't know. I was going to say, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Saul, you wanted to comment. Um, just to make it clear, uh, there is no doubt that paradigms, theories, uh, you know, right research questions, the uh, most relevant research questions are very important. However, I limited my talk to the issue of precision in geography, the need for precision. And I was very, I pointed out that there are several decades when precision or when a, a computers were rejected, data was rejected. And rejecting the use of data means that I'm crippled. I'm making myself crippled from the beginning. I don't want to look into data. I'm ha very happy to report that this has changed. I made a little survey uh, for this uh, presentation. I didn't present it. I made a little survey. I'm happy to present it. This survey took the two of the most important uh, journals, geographic journals in the United States, the Annals of the American Association and the Professional Geographer. You probably know these journals. Very, I know, very, I, I know. I know. I'm very, uh, okay, so, and I was very happy to see that both of them now uh, are uh, having more of the uh, um, uh, models uh, uh, using uh, all sorts of data, all sorts of uh, techniques, all, all sorts of uh, statistics, uh, more than in the previous decades. Now, um, maybe, maybe, maybe I'll use my, 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 my uh, registration to this one. Uh, um, so, um, uh, in the annals, there is a ratio of 40% for uh, using uh, data, models, statistics, and still 60% of very soft reports of all, all sorts of things uh, from all various places of the world. The professional geographer is much better. About 80% uh, of, the, of, of, the, of the articles are using heavy data, big data, heavy statistics, and only about 20% are some soft geography. So I'm very happy that the trend now is turned around and going into uh, using more precise uh, kind of uh, research. And I believe that it will result in a much more uh, meaningful uh, uh, results as well. Thank you, Saul. Any questions from the audience, from you? Okay, one comment. I have, I have one question, one reservation. I have one reservation about using Yeah, I have one reservation about using metric data for scholarly um, performance, and that is, we, I think we become obsessed. We become obsessed with SSCI rankings to the extent that people 
cite themselves, cite my friends, not my enemies. Um, <laughs> and it becomes almost self-aggrandizement. And these are very easy to do because they, you can always find a citation ranking for yourself or your friends and turn this into your dean. But are, don't, don't, does anybody take a look at the quality of the, of the measures that are used or the quality of the journals? I don't think most people read journals these days. They read selective articles in a journal, don't they? That's the other thing I was going to make. Was I think we, we read selectively and we teach selectively. We don't teach you knowledge, we teach you how to use your knowledge. That's the most important thing I think we do. I was on an email um, correspondent with a chemist recently because she's contributing a chapter to this book on language about how, would you, how are you going to communicate and find out about extraterrestrials? That's a good question. And her thinking is primarily it's going to be through chemistry. And she said, chemistry field is changing from a production science to a, a knowledge science. It's very interesting. It's a big difference, isn't it? And she's saying if you find somebody or something from another planet, you're probably going to want to do some chemical analysis. We think we want to ask them to draw a map. Forget that. But chemistry is probably more basic to most of us than, than mental map knowledge, isn't it? So it's interesting how this field has changed from just simply producing more and more chemicals, but what are you going to do with this? That's why I say I think it's important. What you do with your geography knowledge is question C or section C1 or C, C1 or C2. That's what's important. A lot of A and B, we can figure that out easily. All right. Thanks. Any question from the floor, please? You don't? You want? Yes, Owen. Yeah, it's an interesting discussion, and I really i am sorry I had to be late because of the visitors to the other session in the conference, in the border conference. But um, I think on the point of precision, I want to challenge Shaul. And not on the conceptual, not on the philosophical, because of course the quantitative and the qualitative and the combination between them, I think it's Hachner and myself and Evi Stern, we use combinations between them. It's not either or. But on the precision of your comments, uh, because you presented very partial data to journals and you projected a trend in the whole discipline. I would say that the growth in geography of the last two decades is actually in the social science and the hum humanities. Incredible growth. I don't want to actually put a, put a figure on it because I don't know. But I surveyed, uh, two years ago, I surveyed uh, 20 leading journals and I saw that the biggest growth areas are two, <coughs> economic geography and cultural geography. And much of economic geography actually is not quantitative. It's like a Hanuman sort of, you know, beyond or bounded or post-rationality uh, geography and, and it's behavioral geography. Part of it is quantitative, but I think you have to be, uh, because there's so many students here, you have to be uh, accurate to the development in the discipline which are much more diverse, uh, there is no either or, there is a growth in, uh, in uh, social science uh, uh, that is related to quantitative methods. And also let's think who are the great thinkers of geography? Who do we know in geography? Who are the most quoted geographers, right? You come up that they are sometimes just philosophers. Only Lefebvre, for example, is the most quoted person in geography in the last decade, and he's a philosopher, right? Why? Because he's not number crunching. And number crunching, by the way, is not derogatory. It's just people that deal with numbers, right? He gave us new bottle to understand space. Now we debate it, etc., etc. So just to put things straight, it's much more diverse than what you said. It's not one revolution, another revolution. It's coexistence of different paradigms, and the quantitative and qualitative coexist and develop in parallel. Procedural. Alright, thank you. <laughs> You have professed that you are using both. Iran? Yes, and I, I'm very great to hear, very, very, very delightful to hear. Yeah. Iran, please. Just a comment on where I think the profession is going. I think we are uh, actually on the verge of the fact that we are going to have so much data that is uh, geocoded, geolocated, and mixed with many things that are related to social practices and behaviors, and with the ability of Story, data storage and computing, we're going to have a lot uh, in terms of discovering what is our inner space, what is human space, and seeing what kind of relationships and what kind of uh, spatial models we can... Was in the body? No, in the mind. If you have, if you have any friends who are in the neural sciences, 
Do you have any friends who are in the liberal sciences? I'm, I'm actually trying to make friends in the liberal <laughs> sciences. You find out actually, one thing in common is they will tell you we don't know very much about the brain. Exactly. See, just exactly. like the first comments I made about we don't get the planet Earth it's either. True. It's true. We so, use very little of our brain, unfortunately. It's, it's so true. Scared but, of death. but this will give us give us a new a new depth into into societal processes. But one word of caution: this will be very good for present and for past analysis. So it's a bit like like astronomy. They go into the past and are looking what is happening in the past. They don't really know what's going into the future. So but they, but we they, still have a lot a lot to, to think about in terms of, uh, of contemplating and uh, trying to uh, plan and project. And there, it's still it's still a lot of uh, trial and error. But if you talk to these people, whether it be in neurosciences or extraplanetary sciences, you find out that they're also interested in networks, and landscapes, and cores, and peripheries, and, and distances, and black holes, and silences. Same thing we talk about, don't we? So we have a lot in common. I think that's that's the kind of point I've been making, is we should look for what we have, commonality we have, not in terms of the differences. The differences were used to create disciplines and departments in the 19th and 20th century. Let's go beyond that. I think most students today want to take courses across disciplines. <coughs> Maybe I'm dead wrong. I must say that I see two parallel uh, processes nowadays. Again, I didn't do research how many uh, researchers are on one direction or the other. I think the main difference between the two directions is that one is based on observations. And after the time of uh, positivism, logical positivism that was based on observation, now we return to uh, studies that are based on observation, but not on the same principles, but more concepts like complexity, chaos, and so forth. We cannot predict, we don't claim to predict, we understand that the world is much more complex than we uh, were able to comprehend in the old observations of positivism and so forth. So this is one trend that is developing very uh, fast now. And the other one, deal with interpretation, which is something very different. And this is qualitative. So again, I stress, the question is not methodological. The methodology comes out of the perspective. When to interpret meaning, quantitative methods are not so useful. You have to understand how people think, how they develop their ideas about the world, how they act in the world, and so forth. This is a different world. It's a world of narratives, of, uh, of uh, discourses, and, uh, and so forth. So, these are the two directions that I see. Thank you. Thank you, um, Thank you very much. Uh, um, I want to make a short comment about, um, and follow Eli's uh, opening with, stay relevant. And I think there are three, three directions that I think human geography can contribute in the future. And obviously, if we have more time, we can raise more and more uh, directions. But uh, one, and I was supposed not hear it almost, is we enter the, the urban era, and it's clear that as geographers we have a lot of advantages in that in that field of urban urban studies and urban research, and I think this is one direction that human geography can continue and con contributing to the uh, to the world. The other thing is that we there is more and more evidence that we are living in. Uh, we are entering uh, an era, or living in an era, with of limits, uh, biophysical uh, uh, aspects, and and uh, this is where, and we need to ask ourselves more and more questions about how we are managing um, our life in in a limited in a limited uh, biophysical uh, planet. And the third, uh, the, a lot of been, a lot of been said about <coughs> interdisciplinary, but there is a lot of things that we can contribute at the interregional uh, scale. So we are we are studying scales. A lot, and we are expert in region regions uh, um, research. But more and more, we understand that there is strong connections between what's happening in one place and another, and there is more and more need, and, and it's a field that we can contribute to to make the linkages between between what happened in one place to other place and to the sustainability of people in in the other in third place. Thank you. Thanks. If you take a look, take a look at your first question, what percentage of the population of, of Earth lives in cities? What percent? Well, we, cro we crossed the, the, the 50 percent. The 50 percent means. If you, if I agree with you, but do we have 50 percent of our knowledge now dealing with rural areas? I would say no. I'd say we're very, very selective in what we study. Unfortunately, we know much more about Europe than we do about Sub-Saharan Africa, don't we? Yes. Give us back. 
between Cairo and Kailisha, or Cape Town and Kailisha. We know much more about the rich world than the poor world. We know much more about Christianity than we do about Islam, right? Yeah. We know very much about Buddhism or Hinduism. Going back to Orange's question, I, I think that it's be interesting to take a look, if you've done this survey the past couple of decades, one of the questions I asked my geographers in China, if you take a look at the 25 leading journals internationally, the contributions by Chinese geographers and Indian geographers in the past 20 years, I think there have been many, many, many more studies on Chinese by Chinese geographers studying innovative topics, especially GIS and cultural and social geography. And I still think, I think you made the point, we're still kind of, Indian geographers are still kind of locked into a colonial administrative view of looking at the discipline. That's my idea. I think that I have to add that we are still in a colonial world. Not only that we study more the Western world, we develop concepts that fit the Western reality and we impose them on the rest of the world. And if you are from uh, Ghana and you want to say that the, world, the space is, uh, is, uh, looks different from what it looks from Europe, for example, the opening of borders, the end of borders, nobody in Africa heard about it. But if you are a geographer in Africa and you try to publish in political geography a paper that says that there are still national borders that are very solid and firm and lively, probably the paper will not be accepted. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't know the literature, of course. The literature says that there are no well, borders. They need our literature. Yeah. Any other comments, questions? Yes, please. I was a Germanist geographer. I, I have some sentences, maybe not question or comment. Maybe question, what about geographical education? Because um, by specialization in geography, we forget to teach a young generation, our students, and which will come after us, will continue or not, if they will be very, very well um, organizing the very narrow discipline. But if you will not think about how to teach them to, uh, to understand and uh, geographical, uh, how, uh, to teach them geographical understanding, geographical interpretation. Now we see that uh, regional geography disappeared from the programs of all of the universities. And uh, when we only feel, thinking about the specialization and the uh, uh, deeper research in our special our discipline and when uh, non not geographers go now to our research to our field some geographers forget that that for example sociologists and economists now uh, come to our area and they uh, using uh, the better technology new methodologies are more creative more expensive they take our tema and where we are even when I look at the popularization of geography, uh, a lot of geographical journals now are full of reclama because it's, pro for example, problem with money, so we need some people which will donate it. So now, even the National Geographic, even I, when I look at my Polish uh, geographical uh, journals, uh, we had such, uh, for schools, continents and uh, no knowledge about our country now. 30% of pages are occupied by, by the names of donators of another. And, paradox, in the board of the scientific board on this, uh, this um, journals are not geographers, only sponsors. When I look at the quality of the National Geographic, there are beautiful artistic photos. But where is the geographical knowledge? Even uh, we talk about these pictures here, a lot of landscapes are made in such a um, way. So this is for people very well edu educated artistically how to read this picture. Imagination, our imagination came in 50% from the picture. And another, uh, professors usually very good, very good specialists, very good in their area. Sometimes uh, they work individually. They don't want to share their knowledge, their methods, like it was in the past, when I was a student, my professor took me to a very good conference, when during one conference I met all great professors, which I know only from literature, but a personal contact. I don't know how it is uh, in your universities, but I, I observe in different when I was during my 
my visits in, in different countries, that now is no personal contact, professor, student. Sometime, sometimes a professor gave tema, give tema and say, okay, do it, come with results, or they contact by internet. It is quickly, more quickly. Um, some students uh, don't think what, how I will use, why I need geography, because I'm thinking not about the, the space, uh, the, the bigger space, only they feel, uh, thinking about how, mu how much money I will have for this. So this is another space of thinking. Maybe this is a little sarcastic, but I'm afraid really that this barrier, this distance between the people which uh, meet us, because uh, like a Mm, they are, mm, which show us how to do, but to where, to where we, we lead them. And I think that we must be more responsible of educational part of the side of the geography. We don't really teach geographical, uh, ge thinking uh, and understanding geographically. And uh, I think that is very important. For me, even the uh, uh, space and place of uh, Futuan, I would be the the basic uh, literature for all students, that some of students don't know who is Ifutuan. Very, his simple sentences are full of knowledge, but now they know more about technology of computers, how to use this, how to make presentations, but presentations sometimes are full of pictures without knowledge. This is only the how to, how to use time saying nothing. I think about this part, our responsibility of education in geography. Thank you. Thank you. There's many questions. Last comments from the stage. Any, anyone would like to say anything more? First, I agree with you and I agree with Foucault that geography is extremely important in our era. Even to understand the news, when the news are jumping from the conflict in former Yugoslavia, to terror in uh, or uh, war between India and Pakistan, to problems in Senegal, and uh, one second afterward, uh, weather forecasting and so forth. Without basic understanding of geography, you don't understand the world around you in your everyday life, in your inside your home. So geography is more important than any time in the past and more relevant. Uh, any time in the past uh, due to the new reality of globalization. I, I think that's uh, one point. I think that the main problem is that we suffer from a weak image in geography. And uh, we, in Israel, I know from my personal experience and involvement that uh, we suffer in the Ministry of Education from low image. Now there is a discussion in of the past. Hmm? in the past. The woman that was in charge of geography in the Minister of Education was upgraded and now we are on the top. Uh, that is something to see. There was a committee now that decided that students will not uh, study 12, 13 subjects for matriculation, but only 5, 6. Geography is not there, of course, and no chance that even with a new woman, uh, geography will be there, probably. Uh, even in the university. In my university, when I was the chairperson of the department, the rector came to me, I'm going to close the department. Said, no, it's easy. You, you have two social geographers, they will go to sociology. You have two physical geographers, they will go to geophysics, and so forth. And it took a lot. I thought that I brought all the best arguments about the importance of geography. Nothing convinced him. Uh, what, he said two things. First, he said, but the geophysicists know better mathematics, so I prefer them. He was from physics. The second point, I showed him the number of publications per researcher in our department. He said, oh, this is convincing, and we must close the department. <laughs> so we suffer from weak image, and this is a problem. This is a real problem. Maybe it's uh, connected to the issue of paradigm, that we have a new paradigm that is successful, can say something very uh, delighting about uh, uh, our world. And of course, GIS and, and the remote sensing brought back a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, popularity to geography, and, and, and it's very important, and there is a good reason why it became so 
popular and useful and, uh, and relevant, but intellectually it narrows a little bit the concept of space, of environment and geography, and, uh, and uh, we shouldn't close ourselves to the technique. We should keep our mind open beyond those technologies. And, and then we will succeed also in becoming more attractive uh, as educators. Just a couple of comments is that the comments you made about geography, I hear those from people in economics, anthropology, even history. <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, my, my, my discipline's becoming marginalized. And we're losing content in terms of instruction in primary, middle school, and the high school levels. So I think somewhere there's a, there's a crisis that we all need to just have continually around us and, and completely readjust our thinking, our teaching, not only our teaching company, but also our teaching modes, which I think are important. Um, I think that probably the, the most integrated knowledge that kids have is probably the primary schools, because they're the teachers now, well, this is the geography 15 minutes, this is the history five minutes, and this is the government for 10 minutes. You know, I think that's silly to kind of compartmentalize knowledge, but we do that simply because we've done it. That doesn't mean it's right. So we're just kind of doing because other people have done it. But I think increasingly, I think that, that college, universities, departments of geography, every other department is trying to reassess its role in, in learning. And I think that's, that's good. And I think they'll find out that maybe they need to drop something, or add something, or retitle something, or come up with different kinds of textbook materials and different kinds of learning. As I said, I think we, we now, the markets are, what do you do with your knowledge? Not simply just giving you the knowledge. There's a big difference, and I think too often in teaching, we've just been teaching you this because we need to get you to know, you know this. You need to know what happened when and where. Not necessarily the why and the so what of it. That's a whole different level of understanding, isn't it? And that's kind of difficult for students to grasp because that's not being asked on my standardized national examinations, not being asked on my examinations to get to the university. That you're asking me to kind of get some wisdom at an early age rather than learning a fact. So I, I welcome all of this. And I think the universities, for all their creativity and imagination and forward thinking, we're really living fossil ages when it comes to organizing knowledge and teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Well, um, I would like to thank all my colleagues here, <coughs> Stanley and Itzik and Michael and Shaul. I would like to uh, say uh, to thank very much Tal our current chairman for initiating this panel. And uh, to all of you who came to hear us, thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you.